talk about. Greetings, noble citizens. If you happen to wander next door, you may have noticed that there's a fish tank with a bunch of seed sprouts on top of it. That is an aquaponics system. It's a fully integrated micro system that models itself after nature by combining the technologies of aquaculture and hydroponics. Aquaculture is the commercial production of fish on large scale, and hydroponics is the production of crops without using soil. And of course, we all know how conventional agriculture works. A bunch of animals produce manure. That manure gets spread on the ground as fertilizer. We plant seeds, we water it, and voila, we have crops. Except it's not really that simple. There are a lot of environmental factors to consider, like weather, like pests, like weeds. So what ends up happening is a lot of agriculturalists have to dump chemical fertilizers onto their crops or pesticides and herbicides. And it requires a tremendous amount of water. Oregon reported in 2011 that they use 9.1 million acre feet of water, which is approximately 3 trillion gallons, and that's only expected to go up by 2050. Major products are hay and greenhouse sales, and a bunch of it is exported, most of it's exported. But the antibiotics, pesticides, and herbicides, anything that doesn't get used by plants gets washed out into waterways, which can lead to eutrophication or the buildup of toxic algae. It can destroy ecosystems, and it's a large economic cost. Aquaculture has some similar issues. Overcrowding of fish leads to the rapid spread of disease. If the fish are genetically modified, they could escape and get out into the wild type and mix their genetics, uh, creating kind of like unpredictable uh, speciation. Added biotics and added antibiotics would go out into the waterways as well. And they have to spend a lot of money trying to control predators that would feed on their fish. Hydroponics, uh, it is a good step. It is a step forward, but it's ultimately unsustainable. They have to add pH neutralizers and other fertilizers. And anything, again, that isn't used goes down the drain. It turns out that if you just combine those two technologies, you actually solve the problems of all three. Aquaponics allows plants to grow twice as fast, uses only a tenth of the amount of water that you would use in conventional agriculture to grow the same amount of crop. It has a 70 to 80 percent smaller footprint, and you can have a massive crop variety which yields biodiversity, and in nature, biodiversity is essential for maintaining a balance. It is more efficient, and that is important. All right, we live in a dynamic world, but our world follows the same rules that the rest of the universe follows. We're never going to get out of any system more than we put in. So everything we do comes down to a matter of efficiency. But on this planet, we see a lot of systems that live and grow and communicate, and they sometimes compete. But now, we have a lot of big issues. I looked into this, I wonder why, why are children starving? Food is uh, essential for survival. It's essential. And so in my opinion, we all have a fundamental right to clean, healthy, organic food. People are fighting over water, resources. Water is essential for survival, so in my opinion, we all have a fundamental right to clean drinking water. We have a lot of energy producing devices. A lot of them are sustainable. Um, so I've wondered why it is that we're not able to provide energy uh, where it's needed. I looked into this, and tonight I'm going to tell you why I'm actually optimistic about the future. The first thing that I learned is that there are actually no authority on global solutions. There is no celestially elected group given the divine charge of solving the world's problems and nobody else is allowed. <laughs> there are a lot of people working on it. Some people may have more expertise. Some people may have more financial resources. Um, and, but anyone in a government or a nonprofit organization position working on these issues, they're a person just like you and me. And these are world issues. And guess what? We're all in the world, so really the responsibility falls on all of us. As a lab assistant working in a pharmaceutical science department lab at Oregon State University, uh, I do take a systems perspective on all of this. 
The goal of the lab is to try to find new chemical compounds that are produced in nature by bacteria we've isolated from uh, soil samples around Oregon. Uh, those compounds we hope to be able to use as antifungals or antibiotics. Uh, what it means, though, is that I spend a lot of time sitting in a lab staring at a petri dish with a whole bunch of different microorganisms on it. And I try to assess the quality of the way that they interact. Sometimes they fight each other. Sometimes they feed each other. Sometimes they don't seem to care either way that something else is growing in their space. But if I extrapolate that knowledge, I come to the second idea, and that is that the big problems that are in our world are due to adverse, reaction, or adverse interactions between systems. But as I said just a minute ago, we still see life in this world, a whole bunch of systems interacting. Biology, over billions of years, through trial and error, has found a way to fit systems together that want to work together, despite all of the threats that exist in, our, in the cosmos and in the world. So that gives me hope, and it tells me that no matter how, complex, how complicated these problems are, solutions do exist. There's a hopey word for what we have, and it means that we're living an unbalanced life. Luckily, if we observe nature and see how nature works and start to model systems after nature, we can start to find solutions that are real and lasting. The current mismatch that I see in the world is between two systems that are fundamental to civilizations, they're fundamentally different. One is a natural system, and uh, one is an artificial system. Um, and they weren't exactly designed to work together the way that we need them to today. They're, of course, agriculture and economics. How do civilizations get started anyways? Well, domestication of crops and animals compelled hunter-gatherers to form agrarian societies. People lived this way for a long time, and skills developed. As more and more occupations became available, you know, we had people making clothes, people working with metal, people working with glass, making tools. More and more people that weren't growing their own food still needed to eat. So, eventually we decided that a great way to determine how valuable something is is to use money. After all, how am I going to know if the shovels that you made have the same value as the veggies that I grew for you? It makes sense to use a uniform currency to communicate value. So fair enough. We started using money as a form of communication, but these days, a lot of people can't even make enough money to afford the essential things, like a home, or clothes, or food. And the real tragic thing is a lot of those people are children. The National Center on Family Homelessness reported that in Oregon alone, there are over 22,000 homeless kids. And to me, that's too many. So, given that depressing thought, I'd like to change the subject. <laughs> I want to give you an example, a prime example, of how modeling natural systems can be beneficial to your health, to your business, to your environment, and to your community. Joel Salatin runs Polyphase Farm in Virginia, and he has a very non-conventional method of agriculture, but all he did was he observed nature and he started cycling his crops and his animals in a way that restores the soil while limiting the spread of disease or, I mean, even the risk of disease. All of his crops are able to get the nutrients they need and all the animals are able to live basically the way that they would in nature and be healthy. In his own words, and I hope I quote this correctly because his use of vernacular borders on, like, Rural American Shakespearean. <laughs> it's all a symbiotic, multi speciated, synergistic, relationship dense model that yields far more per acre than industrial models. And it's all aromatically and aesthetically romantic. <laughs> One of the claims of aquaponics is that if you had a well planned industrial sized greenhouse, you could grow as much vegetation in a year as you could in a hectare of land, of arable land, in that same year. But maybe tackling the whole world right now is a bit too much, so let's scale it back and just talk about Oregon. 
always on the progressive side of things, Oregon has an increasing demand in locally sourced products, especially food products, healthy, organic food. Supporting local economies is a good thing. Um, it keeps money circulating within the state, but in order to grow economically, we have to keep money coming in. So suppose for a second that we set up an aquaponic food hub network in urban areas, a network that could reduce the cost of organic vegetables to their consumers simply because the cost of production is lowered. Not only that, you'll get veg vegetables that weren't picked before they were ripe, they weren't fumigated, they weren't shipped 1,500 miles, and they're, they're far more nutritious. On another note, I keep hearing over and over again that today's young generation is far less likely to outlive their parents than in any previous generation. An aquaponic system in schools could do two things. It could both revolutionize the menu and it could provide a platform for an integrative systems, uh, integrated biological systems based education. But if we stop at Oregon, we haven't done our job. Aquaponics is very adaptable. Going out beyond Oregon, an aquaponics system could be designed to be shipped to an arid environment along with solar panels and water catchment systems in order to provide the need, in order to support the needs of of economies, of regions where they just don't have the same kind of stability that we do. Alternatively, instead of growing food, um, a lot of people drink water and they get sick because there's a lot of human waste in that water. An aquaponic system could be specialized to grow aquatic plants and bacteria that absorb heavy metals and break down toxins, effectively bioremediating that water. If we take our lessons from nature and start to build our systems off of natural models, then we can start to restore the balance between the resources that we require and the earth that provides them. Simply by modeling nature, we're able to do all of these things. And that tells me one last thing. The number of strategies that nature has employed has enabled life to thrive in even the harshest environments. So if we take our lessons from nature, if we take our inspiration from nature, then the number of solutions, the number of possibilities, also becomes expansive. Thank you.